I've got Miriam Manderson with me today. That surname may sound a bit familiar to you. Yes, yes. It's the wife of our very own Theo Manderson. Um, but Miriam, thank you so much for your time this morning. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Now, just so you know, everyone understands who you are and what you do, because it, it really gives context to why we're having this conversation today. Just tell us a bit about yourself and what you currently do career-wise. Um, so as you say, my name is Miriam Manderson. I am the head teacher of a large secondary school of around 1,200 children in North West London. Um, and I've been in education for about 28 years now. So, 28 yeah. years. You don't look yeah. old enough, my dear. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I don't so... think my students think the same. <laughs> <laughs> No, thank you so much for your time today. I mean, it's quite a touchy topic. And why I really wanted to grab you and see if we could have a sit down was because when I mentioned this last week on the show, it felt like I couldn't do it any justice because I'm not an educator. I'm not in the education system. But we we mentioned the story on the show of um, the, the passing of Ruth Perry, um, you know, on the back of an Ofsted rating that she received. And we had so many people texting in their comments and their views on it. And many of them were educators. And I thought it'd be great if mm. we could just have a sit down to kind of look at where things are and kind of get your view on where things need to be. When you heard about the the um, passing of Ruth Perry after the Ofsted rating, what, what was your reaction? So the way I heard about it, first of all, because I'm on Twitter, LinkedIn, you know, and so on. Um, I heard about it through social media and on LinkedIn and my first response was shock because I was thinking, there we are. We finally made it into the news in a very negative sense. Um, head teacher has actually succumbed to the pressure of Ofsted. It's real. This is a real pressure. And I hope the world and other people will see that education does bear with it quite a lot. Um, there's a lot to consider. But then I didn't want to read the article. As a head, it just hit me too hard and I just put my laptop away. I just didn't want to read any more about it. I also knew when I walked in on Monday, somebody would tell me about it. Somebody else would tell me about it. What was really interesting was I had a little bit of empathy and compassion from a member of my senior leadership team. And I know it's because they were thinking, I hope my head's okay. And I know every other head in the country was touched by that story. And I'm not going to say that I, I, it made me depressed or anything like that, but it did make me think, gosh, this is a real, this has had a real impact on somebody's life. Mm -hmm. And it might not just have been offset, but it was probably the last straw that broke the camel's back. Could you just tell us a bit about the impact that an Ofsted rating can have on the professional life of a teacher or a head teacher or just someone who's in education? Yeah, I can actually. Um, as you know, we've had the pandemic. Um, so that was a period of time where in spite of everything that's going on in education exacerbated the already high pressure uh high pressure situation for teachers added to which Ofsted decided that they were going to continue doing their inspections so we thought there might be a pause and a kind of uh you know resistance for schools to be judged with one word the issue is the school is judged on one word, which is either outstanding, good, or two words, requires improvement, that's the third category, or inadequate. No school wants to be judged as requires improvement or inadequate for a number of reasons. The first one, ultimately, is the reputation, because that has a real big knock-on effect on what happens to the school with the intake, um, the way that the school is viewed, it can lead to you know, more issues in terms of funding, if your role starts to drop, it then has a knock on effect on what you can afford to do for the children's in, children in your care. Um, and really, there is so much more to a school's category than just one word. The context, the situation, um, the needs of the community all differ from school to school. So it's unfair. Um, it creates a lot of tension in the mind of head teachers. They are looking after the well-being of students and their staff at the same time. It's a huge weight to carry all the time. 
And when offset are coming, so what happens is when offset are coming to a school, they will let you know on about a day before that they will turn up the next morning um, or two days before. And it, it does create an immense amount of pressure for those that are awaiting offset because prior to that visit, schools already know that they're due, if that makes sense. Right because they try to get round to schools every three or four years. So you'll know that you're due an offset. So you're kind of on tender hooks for the best part of a year, really, making sure your school's getting ready. And that tension is, whilst it's invisible, is very tangible in the mind of a head who has that at the back of their mind all the time. And everything they do every day is going to, um, you know, lead to one word, a one word or two word judgment, which can decimate or uphold what the school's doing. And then these inspections, they're just on the one day. They're not over a series of days. It's just they rate the school on the inspection that they do on a particular day. Yeah, it's based on one day. We call it a snapshot, actually, because I can tell you now, you could come to my school on Monday and have one experience and Tuesday have a completely different experience. Mm. So it is a snapshot of what happens in a school on a day-to-day -day basis. And it all depends on what happens on that day. If you haven't got enough mm. staff in, that could completely tilt the balance towards what might look like a very disorganised, poorly behaved set of students, simply because there might be a load of teachers there that are not your average everyday teachers that are part and parcel of the school's culture and upset that balance. And, and one of the messages that we had come through actually was someone who is a teacher and she says that she knew of stories of, you know, schools recommending that the troublesome kids you know don't come in on Ofsted day and um the stress that the teachers would be under to try and perform for the inspectors so you're not even getting the teachers at their best either right that's right I mean it, it depends on the school and their culture you know some schools have a culture where people go and visit regularly mm -hmm. an open door culture so sometimes in those schools fortunately teachers are used to the visitors coming in being seen or observed as the terms used but other times it's really challenging and teachers are not always performing at their best every single day of the week. Um, so yeah, it, it, it does create that tension and that stress. It used to be worse, but it used to be that you would get months notice that they were coming. Um, that was a very long time ago. As I say, I've been in the, in the education for 28 years, but now they give a short period of time to come. But regardless, it still creates that sense of anxiety, a sense of nervousness that they're going to come into the school with a team and depending on the team you get on the day will depend on the experience you have as a leader and as a member of staff. In in your opinion have you um, always agreed with the way that Ofsted has rated maybe your school or you know have you had differences of opinion and how do those get handled? I've been through about um, about five Ofsted reports from different frameworks, throughout different frameworks, and they've all varied. I will say that only on one occasion did I disagree with the judgment, but in the main part, I've agreed. But I will say this, it takes a strong head teacher and a strong leadership team to really pull out the stops, pull the evidence to get the judgment that you think the school deserves. And that, for me, is where it's also a warped system. It's not quite as rigorous and as thorough as it pertains to be, because it all depends on the skill, the tenacity, the level of understanding of the school leadership team to also demonstrate what the school is effective at and kind of smooth over the areas that they need to develop, not hiding them, recognising them, but giving a, a clear demonstration of what they're working towards and their capacity to sustain a good school or to improve, you know? And if you don't have a very strong leadership team, that could be to the detriment of the judgment of the school. And in terms of, um, you know, fixing things that may need tidying up, is that something that Ofsted advise and give support in or is it up to the school to find that solution? Totally up to the school. And I think that's one of the criticisms of, of Ofsted. It isn't in, in an advisory capacity at all. They come in, they judge, they look around, they grill people, they ask lots of questions. They will ask, um, very rarely will they speak to the head. They have one conversation with the head. It's more about middle leaders, teachers uh, and students. And I have actually read an article which recently said that sometimes 
offset um, balance has been tipped too much towards what the students say about a school. Now, can you imagine if that means that the students are making a judgment about the school more than the evidence on what the staff are saying? Mm. If they were having a really poor experience, it would go one way, wouldn't it? And if they're having a very good experience, it can go another. And back to your comment about some students being asked to not be around during Ofsted again, you know, every school operates very differently. There are some schools that are truly inclusive that will have all their children in on the day that Ofsted are coming, and you will see the school in operation, warts and all. Yeah. I'm a firm believer that it depends on how the school deals with whatever might happen that might not be in congruence or in alignment with what the school wishes as long as they're dealing with it effectively. For some schools, unfortunately, that goes horribly wrong. Mm. Um, I, there's there's some schools at the moment who are denying offset inspections access to the premises of the school. I think one's in Newbury, um, just kind of in, in solidarity after the passing of Ruth Perry. Do you think this is an effective way to bring reform and to bring change? I don't think that's an effective way to bring reform and change because what I would say is every inspection team differs. Some head teachers have had experiences with inspection teams that have not been humane, I call them, mm. like androids coming in and just expecting things to be a certain way and have not treated the staff with dignity as they've gone around. But there are several inspection teams because if you think about some inspection teams are made up of serving te teachers, serving head teachers. So they are heads in schools themselves and they have a realistic view sometimes of what happens in the school and they bring a realistic and humane touch to inspection. I think what needs to happen though is this judgment by one word needs to be removed mm -hmm. and it needs to be a there needs to be a focus more on what the school's doing well based on its context, really taking that into consideration and what they can do to improve. Because one school may have, for example, a larger number of children from disadvantaged backgrounds, a larger number of children without English, and that used to be taken into account in terms of contextual value added, it's taken into account less so. So the same rule of thumb is used to judge every school, and I do think that's unfair. Absolutely. Wow, I feel like I'm learning so much here because I think the way, unless you're part of the system, all you're going to go by is what you hear other people say. But I think you're really breaking it down and I appreciate that element of things. Now, as a head teacher, you've been in the you've you've been in the sector for a long time, like you mentioned, and you've been through your own a few your own few share of um inspections. Has there ever been a time where you felt rather tense, you know, knowing that an inspection was coming up? And how did you manage how you felt? Absolutely. I mean, um, <laughs> my school now, I've been in my school for four years. Um, this is my fourth year. So in a way, they could be coming now. We don't think they will, simply because there is a number of schools they need to re-inspect, which haven't been inspected for a while. And also the pandemic put them about a year or so behind their schedule. So if anything, I'm getting my school ready. And I will tell you now that whilst I say to my staff, we're not doing things for Lofted, we're doing it for the good of our children. At the back of my mind, I still have this thought, well, if they do come, I want my school to be judged good. At least yeah. it is a good school. When I was a deputy head teacher, the school I was working at at the time had, was given, it went from a judgment of outstanding to requires improvement. That's a jump down of two grades. Decimated the ethos of the school and the atmosphere and the staff, who thought at the time they were working hard. Mm. But in actual fact, it did need to improve. And I was in charge of teaching and learning. And the reason it got required improvement was because, sorry, I wasn't in charge of it yet. The reason I, it was um, judged requires improvement was because of the quality of teaching and learning. I then became in charge of teaching and learning. Can you imagine the pressure? I can't. And they were due, <laughs> they were due to come back in two years now whilst as a leader you're working with a team of people you still shoulder the leadership of that initiative don't you you want it to go right so yeah I was on tender hooks all the time I was absolutely doggedly focused on making sure that we were going to be ticked off if you like as good at least for teaching and it meant that much for, much for me and for the school and we did fortunately but it took two years of probably the hardest time of work in my life Mm. moving forward what would you say needs to happen now because every comment that we did get through last week they were not against Ofsted 
and not against um, inspections taking place because obviously we want to make sure that children are protected equally. We want to make sure that teachers and educators don't end up with well-being issues as well. So what would you think of the steps going forward that need to take place in order for it to work collectively? The first thing is I think that serving head teachers need to have a say in how that should happen, how that process should happen. Um, as I say, there are some serving head teachers. I actually personally know one myself who is an Ofsted inspector as well, no two. Um, and they both happen to be humane and they both happen to be up to date and current with what is actually going on in schools. Um, in recent times, many you know school leaders will tell you that schools have become ever more challenging because of the longer lasting effects of the pandemic. So we're like catching up. So there's some things that need to be taken into consideration. So head teachers need to have a voice. I think the framework itself needs to be looked at. And I understand that that will be looked at. I went to a conference the other day and a member of parliament, um, I won't say her name. Will I say her name? No, I won't say her name. Well, if you want, was, uh, <laughs> I don't want to get into politics, but she did mention something very positive. I will say she was from the opposing party that's in power at the moment. And she was talking about having... Uh, a, a, a sort of off the passport where you're judged on a, a holistic range of things, not just this one word that comes out about the school. So you're branded like a stamp of approval, right? You're an outstanding school, stamp of approval. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, there might be other things underneath that are going on that are unseen to the average eye, you know, the average parent in the community. She was talking about a passport which will take into consideration all the contextual uh, areas of school and really look at the day-to-day -day processes of what happens in the school and then come to some agreement about, with the leadership team, what is working well, what the areas are to improve. And I think that's a better way to go around it. And the final thing I would say is, whilst it's good to have a framework which, if you like, keeps the schools on their toes, and make sure that they're meeting the needs for safeguarding and so on, I think at the same time, it's really important that there is a holistic involvement and the community, people outside of education understand what it means for school so that it doesn't lead to a detrimental effect on the school population, the reputation of the school and so on. And the hard work that everybody knows teachers work really hard. You know, they do. Whether you're in a requirement, it requires an improvement school or an outstanding school, they all work really hard. Absolutely. And do you know what? I should have probably asked you this at the beginning, but I think it's probably a nice way to wrap things up because we want to keep it positive. Like we, like you've mentioned, yeah. teachers work really hard, no matter how their schools are being graded. And they literally impact the future generation. Like, I love thinking back to my school days. We won't talk about how long ago that was, but there is so <laughs> there are some teachers and head teachers who I still think of now. And when I think about them, I smile because of the impact that they've had on my life. And some of them are not around anymore, but I'd love to just, you know, go and see them and say, hey, this is what I'm doing now. You know, it all worked out well, despite me being cheeky and me being feisty. And do you know what I mean? Um, what was it that made yeah. you get into teaching? Oh gosh, that's a long story, Belinda. I don't know if we've got time for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, long story short, I guess, I kind of, I had some options. I want to be a journalist at the time. Um, and based on what I was studying, it was languages, modern languages. So I thought, mm, if I go down journalism, I'll just have one narrow path. If I use my languages, the world could be open to me. The world could be my oyster. And somebody told me about teaching. I thought, oh, I'll give it a go. I've done a bit of youth work or working with young people. And I thought I'd try it. I just fell in love with it. Oh, brilliant. Fell in love with working with young people. And I still love working with young people. And that was it. And I could still use my languages. So, hey. What language is it? French and Spanish. Oh, bonjour, madame. <laughs> bonjour, Belinda, ça va? <laughs> ça va bien. Don't ask me anything else. I stopped there. <laughs> That's all yeah. I remember. And and just lastly, you know, like I said, we, we have so many teachers um, who are listeners to Premier Gospel. And I would love for you, because you're a woman of faith as well, I do want to put that out there. What mm -hmm. could you say about how your faith helps you in your career? And also, what would you say to encourage people um, who are teachers, but maybe a bit discouraged in the career path that they've taken at the moment? Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, I've written my book, right? From I do. Teacher. 
Brilliant. Right. Book. So it's available on Amazon and all of that, on Audible. And I don't hide from the fact that I am a woman of faith in that book, actually. And I talk about sometimes when the going gets tough and I draw my higher power, the power of prayer, mm. you know, quiet time and sort of knowing that you're not going through challenges on your own. I think if people are in teaching at the moment, I would say this current period of time is not the best advert for teaching. But I still maintain it's one of the best professions in the world because you mentioned it yourself. You are changing the lives of young people forever. You are living, living to leave a legacy, one of my mantras. So in my educational lifetime, you know, in the period I've been in education, I would have probably touched the lives of thousands of young people, you know, every day in a small way. Sometimes you, you will never know how you touch them. And that's fine. It's definitely deferred, the gratification you get from working with young people in education, but you definitely do make a difference. And in other walks of life, you don't always get that human touch reward that you get from seeing young people grow and thrive and knowing that you have played a little part in their lives. So teaching is definitely a worthy profession to get into. Brilliant. Miriam, We just in case someone missed the name of the book, can you drop that for me one more time and also let people know where they can get it? Sure. The book is called From Hood to Headship. It's available on Amazon and on Audible. And the hood does mean the hood. Yeah, I'm from North Weezy. Yeah. <laughs> so it does mean the hood because I have come from, you know, what we would now call disadvantaged background and worked my way through education to be at what some call the highest echelon as a head teacher of a secondary school. So, yeah. Brilliant. And congratulations on the book and also just where you are right now, man. I, I love it. Absolutely love it. Thank you so much for your time today. You're very welcome, Belinda. My pleasure. Thank you.